Jesus has a bad advertising campaign for, for follower recruitment for his follower recruitment strategy. Uh, he's ridden into Jerusalem as king, having just performed his uh, pinnacle miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And now he turns and he says, my hour is here. I've come to die. Come follow me and die with me. You'll remember these words from uh, chapter 12, verse 23. I'll just reread them for you. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. If we're going to follow Jesus, we have to be ready to die, to die to self, to die uh, reputationally, potentially to even lose our earthly life for the sake of our eternal life. And of course, all of this uh, centres around the fact that Jesus is the light that has come to the darkness of the world and the darkness has rejected him. John sets the scene in, in the opening chapter of his gospel for how things are going to play out. And Jesus has come to defeat darkness, to defeat death, to defeat sin and to defeat Satan. And he's going to do that on the cross at the end of this final week of his ministry that we read about in John's gospel from chapter 12 to the end. And that begs the question, doesn't it? How does Jesus feel about his mission, his purpose, the fact that his hour has come? Well, we see, don't we, in John 12, 27, how it is Jesus is feeling. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? My soul is troubled. You see, the thing is that often we can think that it was no big deal for Jesus. He knew he was going to die. He also knew he was going to be victorious over death and, and rise again. Not a big deal. But of course, Jesus knew what was ahead of him. A horrific death. A death where the weight of the sin of the world was upon his shoulders, a death that would force, leave him forsaken by God. He may have been aware of its purpose and the glory that would come, but it didn't make the thought of being beaten and mocked and executed and separated from his father any easier to stomach. Jesus, of course, as we read back in that opening chapter of John's Gospel, was the word become flesh, really, truly human, facing a really, truly bad human prospect, death. Painful, horrible death. And similar to uh, what we read in the other Gospels, we get Jesus' kind of emotion emotion-laden prayer in this moment. Uh, he continues, having said his soul is troubled in verse 27, Father, save me from this hour. Now, the NIV makes uh, Jesus' uh, prayer here a little more circumspect, like, uh, what shall I say? Save me from this hour? Is that what I'm going to say? And then he says, no. But actually, it, in, 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 in the original, it's not that circumspect. It's, it's, it's more like a real kind of cry of his heart. A real temptation before Jesus right here to ask the Father to take this weight from him, to avoid the pain, to avoid the shame, to avoid the agony. But Jesus knows his purpose. He rejects the temptation and instead reminds himself of God's good purpose for him. No, it was for this 
very reason I came to this hour. I've come to die, to pay the price for sin, and in doing so to bring glory to God. Verse 28, Father, glorify your name. I'm troubled. I don't want to do this, but it's for God's purposes. God, use me and glorify your name. So it's like a one-line mega prayer where God where Jesus kind of goes through the whole gamut of emotions as he faces his purpose and his uh, hour coming to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And of course, Jesus talking about his struggle to come to terms with, with this and uh, his his uh, competing, I guess, desire for not to, not to have pain and yet to do the Father's will, which he ultimately does. It's not too dissimilar to our own lives as we choose to follow Jesus and find ourselves encouraged to die, to die to self, to put to death sin and to walk in holiness and righteousness. God calls us to the same kind of death which leads to glory that Jesus went through. Ours, obviously, slightly less significant for the, for the sake of the whole world, but nonetheless, we live like Christ, called by God, as we put our trust in Jesus, to die as we live out our faith. And the temptation for every one of us is to step back from where God calls us in our discipleship as we seek to follow him. When we think of the the cost, when we think of what we might have to give up, it's easy to say, please God, no. I like things the way they are. It can be when we're trying to deal with sin. It can be when we're trying to think about what's next in our lives as disciples. There's a whole range of ways this can work itself out. Let me tell you a story about the time I was thinking to become, of, becoming, of, of, of becoming the minister here at Lindisfarne. Some of you will know, but maybe not all of you, that uh, a year or two before uh, the parish was vacant, my brother bought a house in Lindisfarne. And uh, I started spending time here and I thought to myself, well, this is a, a nice part of Hobart. And I saw this church here as it's sort of hard to miss when you drive down Lincoln Street. And I thought, what a great position that church has. And I went to Simmons Park and I saw all the kids and I thought, look at all these families here. This is an exciting prospect. I wonder who will become the minister there one day uh, when Sharon leaves. And I knew Sharon had some health issues. And so I thought about it and I prayed about it. I thought, that'd be great. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be fun? What a fun thing that would be to do next. Go be the minister at St Aidan's in Lindisfarne. And it was fun to think about. And, you know, when I was a bit bored or I was a bit frustrated with things at my previous job, I'd think, oh, but how fun it'd be if I went over to Lindisfarne. That'd be wonderful. And then one day, the bishop sent out his regular emails, you know, giving you an update, and in it, it said that Sharon Green had announced her retirement and the parish of Lindisfarne was now vacant, and I felt ill. I remember exactly where I was when I read the email on my walk home uh, from uh, work that day. I felt ill. I felt terrified. I, uh, I, I kind of thought about this a lot and I'd thought in my mind what a fun theoretical idea this would be. But the work, the real life work of actually helping a church to think about its purpose and mission and try and re-engage with younger people, let me tell you I wasn't too far away from Jesus' Father, save me from this hour. But no, God 
was working in me and calling me, and uh, not just me, but eventually the bishop and the parish nominators here decided that that's what should happen as well, and away we went, and I had to die. I followed Jesus, and I had to die to self. I had to die to my own sin and stupidity. I had to die to the, my need to be liked. All sorts of things I'm still dying to as I try and lead you. But that's what happens when you respond to God's call. And I want to ask you today, what is it that God's calling you to which makes you cry out, no, save me from this hour? Maybe it's a sin that you just don't want to confess because you enjoy it and you feel like you can manage it on the side, okay. But you know deep down God's calling you to confess, to deal with it, to break it. Some unhelpful habit. Maybe you need to ask for help, but you're too proud. Maybe there's a relationship that's broken and you know you need to mend it, but the, the thought, too terrifying. Maybe there's a stand you need to take at work against greed or lying or whatever it might be, but you're too afraid of what the consequences might be. Maybe there's some family member you need to share your faith with, some person you know God wants you to invite to Alpha, but the risks seem too great. You know what it is. Instead of saying, no, save me from this hour, say, yes. Father, not my will but yours. Father, glorify your name. I'm ready to die. Well, as Jesus rejects the temptation, rejects that fear, and instead asks uh, God, his heavenly Father, to glorify himself through him, something remarkable happens, doesn't it? The Father answers Jesus' cry and his prayer audibly. A voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And it's not just Jesus who hears. That's not like Jesus there praying and in his mind he says, oh, wow. No, no, everyone hears at verse 30. The, vo uh, the voice was from, uh, sorry, verse 29. The crowd that was there heard it and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to them, uh, to him. And why did God speak? Well, Jesus says in verse 30, it was for their benefit, not his. God speaks and promises that he has glorified and will continue to glorify himself through Jesus so that the people will know that when Jesus is hung up on the cross in what looks like defeat, that in fact what is going on is God bringing glory to himself as sin and Satan are defeated, as death is destroyed. That voice, as Jesus commits himself to the glory of God, as his hour has come, is, is, it rings out so that people would know and so that we would know as we reread the story that God is in control. Well, the people are a bit confused. They're a bit confused because Jesus has said he's going to be uh, lifted up in reference to his death uh, he's going to be taken from them. And uh, the people don't understand this because as far as they understand things, uh, Jesus, if he's the Messiah, it, he's meant to be here for, forever. He's meant to rule from Jerusalem for all time. Verse 34, the crowd spoke up. We've heard from the law and the, that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say that the Son of Man but must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? We don't get it. How, how does this all work? And Jesus responds by saying, trust me, essentially. Follow me and trust me. 
verses 35 and 36. Then Jesus said, you are only going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Jesus' call here is for people to trust him. And they've got plenty of reasons to trust him. It's not, it's not blind faith. They, have, they know what Jesus has been doing. They've seen the miracles. They've heard him teach. And they're still going, well, we can't figure this out. And Jesus is saying, hey, guys, my hour has come. I'm going to be on the cross in a few days' time. Just trust me. Walk in the light while you've got me here. Believe in me and you will become children of the light and you will, it will make sense. Jesus encouraging them not just to believe but also in the fruits of believing, that is transformation from children of darkness to children of light. There comes a time in the life of every uh, human being where they, they have to make a decision about who Jesus is and how they're going to respond to him. And you've come along to church today and you've heard this message and maybe today that is that day for you. Where Jesus says, look, just trust me. I am the one that God has sent. My hour has come. I have died for your sins and I'm inviting you to join me in the light, to walk in the light, to become a children, to become children of the light. And when you do that, that's actually how you're able to do those things we talked about at the start. Fight temptation and live lives of loving self-sacrifice just like Jesus did, because you're empowered by God as his child when you trust in the Lord Jesus. If you want to deny yourself and fight the darkness, you need the power of the light. And you get that when you trust Jesus and become his child. And then when you live your life of self-sacrifice, of dying to self and seeking God's glory instead of your own, You look different. You shine brightly. We heard Phil in that Alpha video talk about how he went for a bike ride with a group of Christians and he was captivated by the character of the people because they were living as children of the light. In the end, God calls us to trust him. And in doing so, he transforms us If you're thinking about becoming a Christian, but you're just not quite sure, that's okay. But I also want to say that I'm not quite sure about a few things, and I've even, like, got a degree in this stuff. Like, there comes a point where you just have to trust. Because if you could figure everything out about God, what kind of God would he be? But what I can say... And what I hope you can say is when you do trust, you see the fruit. You see the transformation. When you live in community, when you go to the park and the the wildlife sanctuary, you see the light. You enjoy fellowship with one another. You die to self and the glory of God reigns supreme. Let me encourage you to trust the Lord Jesus, to look at him as he dies on that cross for you and to ask him to be your Lord and Saviour afresh day after day or for the first time because that is how you will become a child of the light and you will shine brightly in a world full of dark and broken things. Amen. (laughs) 